Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to be talking about the impact of the Dobbs decision uh, on the delivery of health care uh, to women. And I'm delighted to be joined, Lucy, uh, with folks who are on the front lines here of uh, providing uh, the health care that women need. Uh, just a few comments. The Dobbs decision is a shocking uh, uh, act of judicial vandalism uh, by our Supreme Court. Uh, it's the first time I'm aware of where the Supreme Court has actually taken away a constitutional right that uh, women in this country uh, have had protected for well over for 50 years. And uh, you're going to be speaking to us specifically about how that impacts your ability to, to provide health care to women, how it creates a lot of apprehension and fear. Uh, just one anecdote here. When I came home the day of that decision, it was a rally in Burlington, mm -hmm. and there were many rallies around uh, the state. And what I remember so vividly about that, it was different than other times when there's been citizen objection to something either Congress or the Supreme Court has done. And what I would see was anger. Uh, at this event, I saw a lot of fear. There were real, real world implications for people, and they knew that. Um, and I know you'll be able to speak to that. Uh, the second thing that I find extraordinary about this decision is how it's poured gasoline on, uh, and lit the match on the division we have in this country that is already too much. We need more unity. We need more mutual respect. Uh, we need more uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, and what this decision has done is exactly the opposite, because we have peaceful coexistence. There are uh, people in this country who do not want, do not believe in abortion. Mm -hmm. They're entitled to that point of view, but they're not entitled to impose that view on others. And what has happened here with this decision is that it's created a new uh, political division within this country where folks who uh, see the Dobbs decision as justification for them to impose their will on others uh, is, of course, creating a lot of conflict. Uh, and in the Senate, uh, Mitch McConnell has indicated that he would favor a ban on abortion nationwide. Uh, many states, of course, have already passed legislation that would do that. Uh, you know, I'm very, very uh, hopeful here in Vermont that we'll pass Proposition 5. Our legislature uh, has, has, has approved that. Our governor said that he will support that. And, you know, it's great if in Vermont uh, the citizens protect uh, uh, reproductive freedom uh, for women by uh, approving uh, uh, Proposition 5. Uh, and, of course, in Congress I voted for the Women's Health Protection Act, uh, and that would get through the Senate except for the filibuster. But as important as it is for us to pass Proposition 5 here in Vermont, when I talk to women in Vermont, they don't think reproductive freedom should be based on your zip code. And yes, we want to pass that here in Vermont, but Vermont women want the right of choice to be available to all women. And that's why the Supreme Court decision is so bad. So um, thank you so much for coming for the work you do, but now I'll turn it over to Lucy. And it's great to be with you and so admire the work you've done all these years. Thank you so much, Congressman Welch, for well, for convening this roundtable, this is a, such an important moment in history, and also for your years of unwavering support for reproductive rights and human rights. So good morning, everyone. My name is Lucy LaRiche. I'm the Vice President of Vermont Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood Northern New England, Vermont, and Planned Parenthood Vermont Action Fund. Thank you all for being here. I first want to stress that abortion is still legal, safe and legal in Vermont. Unfortunately, there are many places where this is not the case and where the threat looms very large. However, since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, we continue to see the fallout of this devastating and cruel decision. Our patients are scared and they're confused. They want to know where they can still access a safe and legal abortion, what longer-term birth control options are available, and out-of-state callers want to know if they will face prosecution for coming to our area for care. 
In fact, the, anecdotally, we had a person call the health center and wanted to know if they could be prosecuted for an abortion that they had received years ago. Hmm. So this is really creating chaos in the minds of people and, uh, and um, uh, around the country. At Planned Parenthood, we firmly believe that access to sexual and reproductive health care, including abortion, shouldn't depend on your zip code. We are committed to serving everyone who walks through our doors. We're also committed to protecting reproductive rights in Vermont long term. In this November, Vermonters will vote on the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, or Article 22, previously known as Prop 5, which will protect every person's right to make their own reproductive decisions, like whether and when to become pregnant, use temporary or permanent birth control, or seek abortion care. Between now and Election Day, we'll work around the clock to make sure every Vermont voter has accurate information about the Reproductive Liberty Amendment so that they can make an informed decision when it comes time to, to cast their ballots. I'm now pleased to introduce Allie Stickney. Allie Stickney is the former CEO of Planned Parenthood Northern New England, and she serves, she serves as chair of the board of the University of Vermont Health Network. So, Allie. Great. Thank you, Lucy, very much. And thank you, Congressman Welch, for being here today and giving attention to this really uh, very basic and important topic. So I appreciate that. Um, I, th I am here, I think, for a little historical perspective, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my work with Planned Parenthood started when abortion was illegal in Vermont, so mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the early 1970s. So my, my first work, um, some of my first work was uh, staffing and chairing the, what we called the problem pregnancy team that provided information to women about where they could get a, a safe abortion, not a legal abortion, but a safe abortion. And at that time we um, referred women to Dr. Henry Morgenthaler up in Montreal because abortion was not legal in New York State then either. Um, and he was a physician who had abortion facilities, uh, and the government chose not to prosecute him, so he provided safe abortion. So I, I want to draw a few threads from back then mm -hmm. to today as we see illegal abortion emerge again, because mm -hmm. I think there are some important um, uh, uh, language that has resurfaced that I think is important to pay attention to, and uh, some important um, uh, situations where what might not be legal is still done and what might be legal is not done. So I'm going to give some examples of that. So um, first of all around language, a word that I am see seeing surface again is the word elective abortion. Um, we used to use that term um, back when, when only some kinds of abortions were allowed in the beginning days. And now I'm seeing it reappear again, and I think one of the dangers of that is it implies that some, re some women have valid reasons for seeking a, an abortion, and other women are seeking abortion only just they don't really need to, but they just want to. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to be aware of that sort of language that puts women into different categories depending on their reasons. For, for seeking abortion. Um, the question of things that are done when, um, <clears throat> when abortion uh, is, is not legal but is done. Um, one example would be the, um, that telephone service we had, which was illegal by Vermont law, um, but we did it anyway. Um, and I think we will see that happen again. I think we will begin to see people taking action that may not be legal, but they're going to do it. Um, so I think that we're faced with uh, that in this new day. The other thing to pay attention to is when things are legal, but nobody will provide it. So um, back when, um, in the early days of abortion provision, when abortion finally did become legal, there were many physicians and hospitals who did not want to perform abortions. And that, so that's, that's a reason that, that women's health centers um, uh, came forward, Planned Parenthood came forward. So I think that's a that's a piece we have to pay attention to uh, in our current current situation, where abortion may still be legal in Vermont, but we need to make sure that <clears throat> it continues to be available. Um, and I'll and I'll I'll close by giving one more example, which I think might sound far fetched, but um, in today's uh, environment, isn't necessarily, and that's around contraception. So again, in a historical perspective, contraception was legal in the early 70s, 
but a young women could not access it because there wasn't a provider who would provide contraception to women under the who uh, who weren't married and might be under the age of 21. So Planned Parenthood had an under 21 program when we made sure that unmarried women could have access to contraception. And I think we have to be aware of that um, in the days coming up too. Uh, things may be legal, but some providers may choose because of political pressure not to provide services to, to women or to, and, and to young women. So those are some of the, the lessons learned yeah, um, from you. the early days, um, which I used to think were history, but now you can see some of them um, Re-emerging. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So. Thank you, Alec. Chilling to think about. Thank yeah. you, Allie. Um, so now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Stephen Brown, an OBGYN and geneticist, as well as an associate professor at UVM Medical Center. Dr. Brown. Oh, good morning. Um, yeah, I guess thank you for your comments about language. I, that's something I've struggled with myself over the years. <laughs> it, and, you know what you're saying is correct. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, my own comments here have to do with the fact that, that uh, for me, abortion is something that is a practical matter. It needs to happen. There are patients who need it and who are going to get it one way or another. And, you know, we're fortunate to be here in Vermont where we're not restricted, at least not yet. And I feel badly for my colleagues around the country who can't offer care to patients who desperately need it. And, you know, to illustrate that, I can say that just in, since the time of the Dobbs decision was made, I've had, you know, four patients with pregnancies with lethal abnormalities a mother whose life was in danger from her pregnancy, as well as numerous other, you know, cases with with extremely compelling reasons for termination of pregnancy, and I can only imagine that if that's happening here in our small state, it must be on a much huger scale in other places. And I, you know, feel badly for those people, uh, and I guess I. I'll just finish up by saying that I think that the idea of, of having a constitutional amendment here in Vermont to protect abortion rights is a very, very prudent uh, idea that I'm hopeful to see pass in the fall when it gets voted on. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. You. Brown. Thank you. I'd like to now turn it over to Tanya Sirota Winston, the Director of Clinical Care at Planned Parenthood Northern New England. Hi. Thanks, everybody, for being in one of our uh, health <laughs> centers here. Um, I would just share um, our perspective at Planned Parenthood, um, where we have definitely already provided abortion care for people who have traveled great distances in this mm. country. Um, since actually SB8 in Texas, I myself um, helped provide abortion care to somebody from Texas two weeks after SB8 was passed um, in our Rutland Health Center. So it is already happening that people are traveling great distances and sometimes finding their way to Vermont as their way to access their needed care. Um, we certainly anticipate that to continue and to increase um, unfortunately, in these times. Um, then there are the other impacts that we see already, you know, as the congressman mentioned, just that fear, like the number of phone calls that we've already received mm -hmm. in our health centers of people local and from, you know, great distances calling with, you know, questions about how to access care, sort of reassessing their approach to their reproductive health care. You know, we've seen a big upsurge in people seeking sterilization services, seeking long-acting reversible contraceptives, IUDs and implants. Um, I've cared myself for people who are here for the summer in Vermont at home and feeling very worried about heading back to college in other states in this country um, and feeling a lot of you know, need to receive services here in Vermont before they head back to college. Um, 
So it, it is already having an impact in our health centers. We're super proud to be here to see those patients and to really show up for them. Um, it certainly calls on us to do even more than we have before, um, but it, it really is already impacting uh, providers um, in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's amazing. Two, within two weeks of the Texas decision, you had somebody from Texas here. Mm -hmm. Wow, amazing. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. By the way, there are states trying to make it illegal to travel, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which yes. is scary, isn't it? Yeah. yeah this yeah. Is, I mean, that's the division I'm mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. because now there's been, and it, it, it's unleashed that people who believe they, they don't they, they're opposed to abortion are now unleashed to impose that. You and everyone else, and that's the fear and that the we see in our health centers. That. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya. And as um, I'm pleased to introduce to you here, Sydney Cordozo. She attends Lerner College of Medicine at UVM. Thanks yeah. for being here. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'm also here with my friend and colleague Brittany, who's um, a second year um, at school with me as well. Your second year. I'm a third year. Third year. He's a second year, yes. All right. Seniority. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, yeah, we just wanted to talk about the perspective of medical students, how this decision is affecting our education, wellness, and our, the overall impact on um, our health system. So to start, um, I guess with our education, we're very lucky here in Vermont at um, University of Vermont to have um, classes on termination of pregnancy. Um, in our pre-clerkship years, which are the first two years. Um, and I'm currently in my OBGYN rotation right now, um, and I've actually been able to be in a case with Dr. Brown, one of the ones he was mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, and so the life-threatening one. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, and so we have access uh, to, lear to these learning opportunities, which is imperative for our learning. Um, and I guess the question is, are other students in other institutions getting the same education? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer to that is mm -hmm. no, they're not. Right. Um, these procedures and this, these um, like medical termination of pregnancy, that's, those are on our exams, on our boards. Um, it's pertinent to our education, and most importantly, it's pertinent to patient care. Mm -hmm. um, we're lucky in Vermont that we're receiving that. We're receiving that, but other places, um, I'm fearful that's not happening. Um, as well, it has implications for residency training. Um, I was with a fourth year resident in the case with Dr. Brown who's interested in uh, maternal fetal medicine and she mentioned how imperative it is for her to be able to offer all therapeutic options to her patients. Um, and she's training at Vermont so she has that opportunity to mm -hmm. learn about counseling and procedural techniques but other institutions do not offer that. Right. Um, as far as medical student wellness goes, um, I think this is extremely distressing for students, um, especially even before getting to medical school, it's already a lucrative and challenging process to get in. And then you have right. the added on challenge of deciding if you can be safe going somewhere um, in your education wow. and your care. Right, because of the laws in that state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, being medical students and residents, a lot of um, people will delay uh, pregnancy because of the rigors of training. Um, and as we know, as you get older, there are more complications with pregnancy. So it's another decision you have to make about where maybe you pursue residency training because you want access to care in case there's a pregnancy complication. There was a stat um, that Brittany and I were talking about where out of a survey of 629 female surgeons, 42% of them had pregnancy complications. Mm. Um, wow. Wow. And it's terrifying to think if you're training somewhere You've gotten, you're, you've gotten to some of the, the peak of your career in training, and um, if something were to happen, that could go away very quickly. Um, so those are some of the things uh, we wanted to bring up. Brittany, do you want to talk about anything? Um, yeah, so I'll just expand a little bit on um, your mention of the way that folks are delaying mm -hmm. um, family uh, building in their careers. Um, on the flip of that, there's also the reality that folks who can become pregnant, including our trans and non-binary uh, colleagues, um, may choose not to pursue specialties which are demanding um, of their time and um, their capacity. So, um, you know, a lot of 
what I've noticed as someone who's been in the medical field for a few years even prior to entering medical school is the disparity in um, gender of uh, the providers uh, in certain specialties. Um, and I think that this decision will only exacerbate that issue, given that um, you know folks who can become pregnant might be less likely to to pursue a specialty that is going to require so much time of them that they won't be able to care for a child that they may have been forced to birth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sydney and Whitney, for your perspective. And everyone, I mean, just like underscoring that you really are the heroes here in this story. And um, Congressman Welch, you especially are wearing the cape today uh, and every day well, trying to yeah, keep us I, yeah, yeah, well, you're, in the You're fight. trying to do that. But, you know, this is a human level issue. It's like mm -hmm. women every day mm -hmm. have to have confidence that they can uh, have make good health care decisions mm -hmm. and get the support they need to do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you've just addressed some of the life uh, situations that so many people are in that now get complicated because government's getting in the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a staggering decision. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 as I mentioned at the beginning, there's really two parts to this. One is the basic freedom of a woman to make her own decision, and that was protected by Roe for 50 years. And isn't that the right way, that it would be? It's not a debate about abortion or not. It's about who makes the decision. And then in those situations where there's a medical complication and there are women, and speaking to people who've dealt with this, Dr. Brown, I know you have, where the, the person who is pregnant has this whole vision of being a mom and maybe getting that room ready for the child, and then you have to give the news that there's a real lethal uh, situation here and there's a heartbreaking decision that has to be made. Well, that has to be the woman and it has to be the doctor. And uh, it can't be the government. It just can't be the government. These are hard, hard decisions. But government should not be getting in the way of uh, the, the 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 woman and the doctor who have to make this uh, make this decision. And then what I've been so upset about too uh, is reading about how doctors are now facing liability when they <coughs> exercise judgment. You know, your job is to give the news and your opinion the best it can possibly be given uh, to your patient. And if you now have people second-guessing you because their they're, they're, uh, the view against abortion, and they're going to be second-guessing your medical mm -hmm. uh, judgment that you owe, you owe to your patient, uh, that's a terrible situation uh, to put that woman in, that doctor in. Do you want to take any questions or anything? Or yeah, yeah, well, um, Can I just add one more thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah I just yeah, want to, yeah, I think you bring up um, a good point on how um, it should be a decision between the patient and the physician. And Brittany and I were talking a lot how um, this decision often, what times, affects those who are most vulnerable. So mm -hmm. that will be our black and um, people of color, uh, as well as our uh, trans folks. So I think. It's important to remember them in that conver in this conversation about how decisions like Dobbs can lead to other adverse decisions right. like prevention of birth control and other hormone therapies, sure. as well as um, just limiting safety and access. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Any questions? Yeah. Did you want to take questions? Mm, um, I think you, if you want to take questions. No, it, whatever. Yeah. You know, we're here, but or we're glad any, if anyone. Any of them. Press, has, Press questions. has questions. I have a quick question. Um, earlier this week, President Biden signed an executive order that would make it easier for states like Vermont that have not um, outlawed abortions to apply for Medicaid vouchers to help pay for procedures for people who might come from out of state here. Um, just how how crucial is that to be able to get these Medicaid or to apply for the Medicaid vouchers to um, to pay for the procedures? Yeah, whether it's Vermont or another state, it is incredibly important that we be providing resources to people who have you know, really been disadvantaged and discriminated against based on where they live in regards to their ability to get health care. This is um, astounding to me that we, have, we live in a country where your human rights depend on where you live and what state you live in. It's, um, it's a travesty. So I th we absolutely support the Biden administration in their efforts to make sure there are resources available to people 
to access critical um, fundamental health care. I don't know if anyone else wants to. You know, it's, it, it's really simple. This is a health care issue. And in a society, we should have health care access for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's that simple. So we should have privacy too. Yeah. If we really had privacy, we wouldn't even have to have this conversation. And you know, Dr. Brown, unfortunately, the Dobbs decision opens the door for intrusion into privacy in other areas. Yeah. And uh, Justice Thomas said that out loud. Mm -hmm. That unless it was in the Constitution, uh, when it was written, it is not entitled to constitutional protection, contraception, interracial marriage gay marriage, a lot of the privacy issues that, you know, we, the, the, the hope of the Constitution, the aspiration of the Constitution is all men, and it was men when it was written, are created equal. And the struggle that all of us have had in our country, and we're all part of, is to broaden that definition. Mm -hmm. where, where are the women? And they're there mm -hmm. now. Where, uh, uh, where are uh, African Americans who are not included? And the goal has been to uh, reach the uh, to, to broaden the definition of the aspirational goal that we're all equal under the law. We should all have equal opportunity. And the Supreme Court, uh, in this decision, is reversing that. Um, the, the other thing this conversation reinforces for me, how quickly these issues have come up. So this is not some theoretical mm. issue that we're talking about. No, that's so right. within weeks, <laughs> right. uh, the women are, are there with, uh, with complications and issues. That yeah, and you know, with so. your history, because you saw it, this was happening when you started in pre, you were there with Dr. Beecham, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was. Okay. Yes. God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> And Congressman Welch, I, know, I understand that there was a vote on the House floor around access to contraception, and there were 195 people who voted against that. Well, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that just yeah. shows you how so divided I mean, this is. Yeah. Just to, mm -hmm. like, for perspective here, yeah. for yes. people who think that contraception is safe and that, oh, they will never do, they'll never go after contraception, that's that was true. really stunning. Right. That number yeah. was really stunning to that's me. That's right. That's right. So, I, you know, I got to say, you're on the front lines. You know, sometimes people say my job is hard. Uh, it's got its challenges. Um, and I, I work with some of the best minds of the 16th century, you know, so that's a challenge. But you're on the front lines. You know, you're dealing in the real world with this woman who faces a lethal situation, a life-threatening situation, and just the stress uh, that that woman is under and the responsibility that you uh, have to give your best advice and to be calm and comforting uh, and supportive. That's hard. and. Uh, I just want to, again, say thank you for the work that you do. I, I have a question, if we're still taking questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when we're talking about the, the financial implications of this and Medicaid, what does it cost to get an abortion in Vermont? I know how much it costs at Planned Parenthood, but I don't know. Yeah, but that, <laughs> that's the most important information. Yeah, so in Vermont, we are fortunate in, unlike other states, where there have been barriers to abortion access long before, you know, these most recent decisions where, you know, the Hyde Amendment prevented using federal dollars uh, to cover abortion care, you know, private insurers could not cover abortion care. Like, the, the actual financial barriers that people across this country have faced to accessing abortion care have been real and present for a very long time. In Vermont, that situation has been different for most of our residents um, in that we, we haven't faced all of those challenges, but the Hyde Amendment has been a really large barrier for many people here as well. Um, this is where, if you've heard about abortion funds across the country, they do incredible work and continue to do incredible work to, to overcome these financial barriers for people and are really stepping up in this moment to cover travel costs, childcare costs. Um, but, you know, anybody can call us you know, at Planned Parenthood and get like a really clear answer about what their coverage is um, how to access those abortion fund monies, um, you know, to help people sign up for state insurance programs. 
And so we're lucky here that the financial barriers to accessing the care um, are much less and very few people have to pay those out-of-pocket costs because of that and abortion funds. Do you know what percentage of patients seeking care are reliant or needing abortion funds? I do not have those numbers uh, yeah, on the top of my tongue. Well, I can say that the, the majority of our patients qualify for Medicaid insurance, so that we do, our, our patient base is primarily lower income people. So I would guess that the people needing assistance at least mirrors that, but it's probably larger than that because we know that those res the, the, the cap on eligibility for Medicaid is still very, very low with regards to f affordability. In other words, you can be making more than the Medicaid eligible amount and still not be able to afford healthcare. Mm -hmm. So we also have um, other sources of funds that we patch together mm -hmm. to make sure that we can provide care no matter what. So we have a, sl a sliding fee scale. We make sure that we never turn patients away. All patients are welcome. We provide care to people no matter what. As it says there on the wall. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> That's great. I got a quick question if that's OK. I guess for, for Congressman Welch, given this Supreme Court decision, what are some concrete actions that you are trying to do in Congress to ensure that abortion access could be, you know, accessible in all across the nation? Well, you know, Congress can act. Uh, the Vermont Legislature can act. And we can pass legislation, the Women's Health Protection Act, that codifies uh, reproductive freedom as we had with Roe. We passed that in the House, and it's only the filibuster in the Senate that's stopping us from passing that. So congressional legislation could overturn the Dobbs decision by providing legislative protection for all women across the country. And we could do that as we did for gay marriage. We did that in the House and there was support in the Senate for that. So this takes action by voters in uh, all across the country to send to Congress representatives and senators who are going to stand up and restore the privacy protections that we enjoyed uh, as a country and as citizens pre-Dobbs. So that's very much within the power of Congress to do if we can get the votes. And that's why elections matter. I, mm -hmm. I am very fond of saying and reminding everyone elections absolutely matter. We have basically two votes in the Senate that are preventing a lot of forward progress yeah. on many issues right now. You know, and I do, I do want to say something about how divided the country is. We all know that. You know, January 6th happened. It's the first time in the history of our country we've had violence, a violent attack on the Capitol in an effort to stop the peaceful transfer of power. And what has happened with the Dobbs decision is that it has added to the division at a time when we absolutely need more unity. We mm -hmm. need more collaboration. We need more mutual respect and acceptance. And when you have now intensified that division yeah. uh, with the Dobbs decision, it's exactly the opposite of what we need in order to heal mm -hmm. this country and to work together and to face some of the major challenges that affect all of us, whether we are a Trump voter or a Biden voter. Now, that's the, the political implications here that are so bad. I mean, and, and, and I don't want to diminish because most important is the individual right of that woman to make her decision about what's best for her, but there's broad political implications that are intensifying this division mm -hmm. that all of us know is really bad for our country. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, you talked a little bit about how demand for reproductive health care has changed, um, and I was curious if how the closure of four health centers in Vermont, one in New Hampshire um, in June, has impacted that. Um, yeah, and if you could speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, I mean, it's a complex healthcare landscape. I think, um, you know, as the congressman had mentioned, it's a very divided country. We've had a lot of challenges as a country over these last couple of years, and healthcare providers across the country, you know, separate from this, have been called to respond to a global pandemic. We're now being called 
uh, and in some ways sexual health care providers uniquely to yet another mm -hmm. public health emergency this week, mm -hmm. um, where places like Planned Parenthood are on the front lines. Like it does take a lot of resources to provide safe, medically accurate, patient-centered health care through all of this. And, you know, we we are we have fallen prey to some of those forces that the entire healthcare industry has at just the wrong time, right? So uh, I can't sugarcoat it and say that access is the same in Vermont as it was before those closures. We have done our absolute best to continue to provide services. You know, our access to abortion care is completely unchanged. In fact, we've been able to expand it and begin to offer telemedicine, medication abortions during this time. Um, our telehealth uh, program really expanded exponentially so that mm -hmm. some of those people in impacted communities could access services. But it is a very difficult time to be a healthcare provider and to be a reproductive healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you all. <laughs> It's really wonderful to be with you. What a great last note there I had. <laughs> Go Kansas! You know what, it, what, what, I, what I so admire in, in about you is that what, the work that needs to be done, they figure out a way to do the work to, to get the work done, you know, and yeah. it's like the Vermont way. And, yeah. and, 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 and you know, that's yeah. what's so, you know, in Washington or the Supreme Court, we should be making it easier to do a hard job. We can't make a hard job easy, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. But yeah. we can make a hard job harder. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's not what we should be doing. <laughs> we should be making a hard job easier. Yeah. I mean, I think about the training you guys go through, you know, you've gone through and what you've done, and, and, and you have to deal with people in stressful situations. And they come in and they, and it, I don't think any of us appreciate what it's like when that person comes in and is so vulnerable yeah. and is so, Mm. Uh, unaware and they don't know what's involved uh, it's new for a lot of them and so it's a combination of your real medical skill and training um, with you know you know being caring and comforting yeah. and mm -hmm. hand-holding in, in a good mm -hmm. way and um, that's what I find so appalling about this decision I mean who are these justices that don't have a clue about what the daily reality is for this vulnerable person who's a good person and wants a future and wants a family and wants to be part of the community and then these barriers are set up where they're terrified and thank my goodness thank you I, I just say thank you for the medical providers uh, mm -hmm. so you know you're doing God's work I just think you're great and I think it's precisely because you all do see the issues up close, <laughs> up close and personal every day. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. why none of us is going away. Yeah, from so you this get work, this court, you know? and it's all it's yeah. all abstractions. And, yeah. you know, um, this is real. So anyway, yeah. thank you. And I think I think all of us in Vermont appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Congressman Walsh. We can't yeah, yeah. thank you enough for convening this conversation and yeah. continuing to lift this mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. It's just. I get embarrassed when you thank me because I, <laughs> this is, I'm just doing my job. I mean, you have the hard job, okay? But thank you. Thank you, Lucy.